Rebecca? Yep. Do you get nervous when people start using the B word around you? Does it feel <laughs> awkward? Does it feel like, man, this is so, I'm getting anxiety here because everybody's starting around the B word. Oh my gosh. Well, welcome to Hardy Party Five and a Half. I don't know where you're going with this today, <laughs> but what B word are you talking about? I'm not talking about that B word, Rebecca. Oh my gosh. I'm talking about the word budget. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mainly because I'm terrible at that. Like at budgeting. Yes. Yeah. But I have high hopes for our guest today who is going to teach us a lot about these things. Her name is Erin Lowry. She has a great book out called The Broke Millennial. It's like a whole series. It's, it's series. like four yeah. books. Yeah. Yes. And I've learned so much from her. Don't let the word millennial fool you because it is for everyone. Because when I was reading it, I was taking notes on my phone all over the place. Mm -hmm. Now I got to figure out how I'm going to handle my budget now. <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> and because, are we going to do that together or are we going to do that like seven? Oh yeah, let's do it together. Seven? Okay. Let's compare our notes and work together on this. Okay. Yeah. Sounds great. Well, you are going to get a lot out today. So grab a pen and paper. You're going to want it. Enjoy this interview with Aaron Lowry. I didn't realize you were in New York. Um, what part of New York are you in? I'm in Manhattan. Oh, okay. My cousin owns a little pub in Brooklyn. We go up there some and go eat at her. Nice. Yeah, it's a lot of fun up there. We love what it. part of Brooklyn? That's where my sister is. Um, she, she, um, Williamsburg. She, yeah, she's in yeah. Williamsburg. She owns a little bit of um, Teddy's Bar and Grill. Nice. Very trendy. Very trendy neighborhood. Yes, it is very trendy. It's a fun time. Yeah. Uh, I asked that because the first question to ask you about this awesome book you have out, we both read it. It's so fantastic. But when you mentioned Krispy Kremes, I was like, where's she from? Because I didn't think Krispy Kremes were everywhere, right? Well, they have moved up here. Okay. I didn't realize yeah. that. Krispy Kreme and Chick-fil-A have both migrated. Oh, 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 okay. See, we're Texas. We're in Texas. So. Well, the thing that really, do you, I mean, Chick-fil-A must, oh, I know for sure it's in Texas, but it yeah. must have taken a minute to get there. Like I, so as a kid, Chick-fil-A and Krispy Kreme, I lived in North Carolina until I was 10. Okay. And, um, it does really make me giggle here because Chick-fil-A in New York, I refuse to go here mostly just because experientially, uh, my pleasure is there's no level of sincerity there is uh <laughs> it is truly just dead in the eyes and when you hear like a new york accent on a my pleasure i'm like i just can't like it, there's no authenticity to this experience for me <laughs> new york and my pleasure do not go together do not go together yeah. they really don't uh it's also really funny to see people like from the bronx being forced to use rhetoric that they're like this is just not how I talk, man. <laughs> so you can only DoorDash Chick-fil-A, basically. <laughs> like for sure. I, I usually like I really do reserve Chick-fil-A for like A, if I'm on a road trip. Mm -hmm. It is the one fast food that never makes me feel ill afterwards. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, same. Which is just amazing. Or two, like if I'm at my parents' house, okay, here is my life hack on <laughs> if you want a chicken and biscuit situation and you're not gonna go to a restaurant. Chick-fil-A chicken, Bojangles biscuit. Okay. Okay. Because Bojangles has the far superior biscuit to a Chick-fil-A biscuit, but Bojangles chicken. Yes. Not a lot of room to grow. <laughs> Will you actually go through two drive throughs to make that happen? I have done that before. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm only there like once or twice a year. So if right. I yes. Well, sadly, Texas has not included we don't have Bojangles. Bojangles yeah. Yeah. But he was born in North Carolina. I lived in Georgia for a period of time. So we we feel that. We feel what you're saying. So, yeah. so but we don't have Bojangles here. We can only get that when we go visit his family. Yeah. <laughs> I really knew I had like completely lost my Southerner card when I could no longer drink iced tea without it being half and half. Like oh, I'm like, yeah. oh no. Yeah. I have fully lost it. <laughs> yeah, you're out of the you're out of the gang. <laughs> yep. Can't do it anymore. Just can't. I I really blame living in Japan for that one though, because there's like no sweetness to the tea. Yeah. So when, then when I came back, I was like, oh, oh my God. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's startling. Well, when you go overseas, there's like, we're so used to the shock of sugar in everything American. And everything. if you go overseas, there's no, they don't use sugar like we do. Mm -hmm. So it's a total no. culture shock. Yeah. That and so one of my big memories on that particular situation was when I was a kid and we lived in Japan, there was um, my first trying of Starbucks was actually in Japan. Oh. But for Frappuccinos, when they put whipped cream on top, it's really just heavy whipped cream. There's no real sugar. Like it's a very light amount of sugar. Yeah. And I'm like, what is this plain cream? And now I love it. Like that is how I will make my whipped cream if I'm making it at home. Instead of like my grandma used to make it so you could like crunch the sugar still. Oh, like yeah. there's so much sugar in the whipped cream. That's hilarious. So that's, I think that's called meringue. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> but did you know? Okay, we're so off topic right now. But did we're you, learning more about we're, life hacks here. Yeah. Did so you know that if whipping heavy whipping cream, it turns to butter? Did you know that? No. Yeah, it'll crest. It'll crest over. It'll split and then it'll crest over. You just keep doing it. You make your own butter with heavy whipping cream. Just keep doing it. It'll turn right into butter. And then you pour off the whatever, like there's like a little bit of liquid in it. You pour off the water and it just is solid butter. We learned that because we interviewed a girl from the Great British Bake Off. So it's legit. Um, a lot of questions about Great British Bake Off. I know they're trying to bring a like American version here. And I don't know about y'all, but I am not a Great British British Bake Off fan. And my friends make a lot of fun of me because they're like, why don't you like it? Like, they're too nice. I can't. If there's not some level of competition, like... I am so deeply American about my reality shows that if someone is not crying by the end of an episode, I'm really not that interested. This is not the show for you, unless you want to put somebody from the Bronx that works at Chick-fil-A on the Great British Bake Off. I would love to watch that happen, truly. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> no, and I now they're, they're doing this thing on, well, I'm sure they're doing it on TikTok. I'm seeing it on Instagram where it's, I don't remember the names, the lady and one of the guys, it's not Paul Hollywood is trying American candy and commenting on it. Yeah. I get so defensive so fast. <laughs> like the one guy was like, oh, a Snickers. I like a Snickers. And he takes it by, he's like, oh, this version is not good. Apparently they don't use real chocolate in America. And I was like, get out of here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we use real sugar in every single thing. Yeah, we do. Okay. Uh, or corn syrup. That's right. High fructose cones, corn yeah. syrup, for sure. That's the way to go. Okay. Let's get back to what we're supposed to be talking about today. But we do go back to food originally, which is how did a Krispy Kreme donut change your life? Well, for those who have either read the very first blog post I ever wrote back in January of 2013, when I promised blogs were still relevant and somewhat trendy, or picked up my first book, Broke Millennial, I do talk about how in my household, my parents were very big on, we're not going to hand you money. If you want to buy something, you have to figure out how to earn the money yourself. And when you're, you know, like seven, you have very limited earning potential. And my mom was having a yard sale. So I figured if people were going to come and buy, this is going to date me, but a used abs of steel video from my parents, mm -hmm. I'm 34 for those who are listening. <laughs> Uh, and that was popular when I was seven. But if people are, you know, going to come buy stuff at a yard sale in the suburbs of North Carolina, then it was uh, probably likely they would buy donuts from cute little kids. That's right. <laughs> so all I like Shark Tank style, I went to my dad and pitched this idea of like, what if I sell Krispy Kreme donuts at the yard sale? And he was like, okay, great. I will go get the donuts. Bring them back. You can handle selling them. And I was like, yes, I'm going to go to Toys R Us and get Nerf Gun Super Soaker. Like That was what I was so excited for. <laughs> My dad goes, gets, and these numbers change literally every time I tell this story because I never totally remember the exact numbers, but something like several dozen donuts. I set up my little Fisher Price picnic table, strap on my teal fanny pack, <laughs> recruit my four-year-old sister to help me sell these donuts. And we sell out pretty quick. And I'm there looking at mounds of quarters and I'd made something like 20 bucks. And my dad comes over and he's like, okay, well, you made $20, but your sister helped you for a little bit. So let's pay her $4. And then I bought the donuts and those cost me $6. So you have to pay me $6. So actually your net profit is $10. Mm. 
And this wasn't like a just telling me and like trying to explain net profit. No, no, this was a full experiential situation because he then took the money that I both owed him and my sister. <laughs> and that was the day I both learned about net profit and like just the general unfairness of how life works. Yeah. But I still did get to buy my super soaker. So I was pretty. Yeah, confused. it smacked you square in the face, didn't it? <laughs> Candy tax was another popular one that he liked to levy. So when I got my first real paycheck, I was like, I was ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that your parents did talk to you about that because mine didn't. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work out for me early on. So why are we why are we afraid to talk about finances? It seems like a taboo subject that we don't want to get near. Oh, it is. And there are a multitude of reasons that I believe people are afraid to talk about money. I think when we just think about the parent-child dynamic, there's a few things there. First of all, a lot of parents don't know how to handle money. So then who are they to teach their children is kind of the feeling. My big pushback on that is whether or not you actively take a role in teaching them, you're still teaching them by whatever behavior that you're modeling and whatever language that you're using. So if you're using language like we can't afford that, you might be creating a scarcity mentality within your child. Whether or not your family actually can afford that, you might just be saying it because you don't want to deal with the conversation about why you don't want to buy them the sneakers that they're going to outgrow in the next you know, six weeks because they're growing so fast. The other part is the fear of judgment. Like, I think that's what all of this really comes down to. It is so much easier, like if you're sitting next to somebody on a plane, you're probably willing to spill a lot of life secrets to this total stranger on a plane because the odds of seeing them again, I don't know, slim to none. Yeah. If it is your best friend, you're probably not going to admit if your family is struggling with some sort of financial issue right now, if you have a personal crisis that's going on, depending on your relationship, that might feel embarrassing to you. It might risk judgment, but especially when it comes to money, we really also wrap morality up with money a lot. We hear things like good debt, bad debt. That's a lot of language that frustrates me too, because I really would like to strip this concept of morality out of the conversation. And these things are just a neutral. They just are or aren't a fact of your life. Like debt doesn't need to be good or bad. It just exists in the world because of situations that arise. Yeah. So, so give me an example of like, when you're saying, don't really say to your kids, like we can't afford that. What's a better option? Well, I think the better thing would be to talk about situationally, right? So if your child, I'll, I'll pull it back to an experience of my own childhood. I really wanted clogs. They were all of the rage back. This would have been like 1998, mm -hmm. seven, nine, seven, eight. And I really wanted a pair of clogs. I was also a kid that was growing really fast. And my feet were bonkers large and I tapped out at five, three and I still have nine size, nine feet. It's very, oh, wow. cute. but wow. <laughs> my mom was like, I am not spending $20 on a pair of clogs that you are just never going a, probably not going to wear very often and be going to outgrow. But instead of saying like, absolutely not, we can't afford it or any language around that. She goes, if this is something that's important to you, you need to figure out how to buy it yourself. And I did. So like, I did my little Krispy Kreme donut kind of hustles. I would cat sit for like the actually demonic cat that lived next door to us when our neighbors <laughs> would go out of town. I had a friendship bracelet making. And this is also a way to, you know, encourage a kid to be entrepreneurial and sort of yeah. think about how to do things themselves. Saved up my money, went to Payless, bought a pair of Navy felt cork bottom clogs. And I went to a Catholic school and clogs were banned as part of the, like being not part of the uniform the week after I bought them. Oh, oh man. So I also have like a lot of issues around buying clothes, even as an adult, which is a whole yeah. thing that's not my mom's fault. <laughs> but to also encourage, and I think my mom did say, I'm not sure that you'll wear them a lot and you're going to outgrow them quickly. But if this is something that you want to spend your money on, you can make that decision. Yeah. And allowing kids to also make some values-based spending choices for themselves when they're young is important because they're learning lessons. The other thing you can do as a parent is I'll go 50-50 with you. You want this toy, I will pay for 50% of it, but you have to pay for the other 50%. Mm -hmm. My parents would do that all the time too when I was little. And the amount of impulse purchasing that that taught me how to curb when I was a kid. So by the time I was an adult, that was something that I could more reasonably think through yeah. is a hugely beneficial 
life lesson. Now, listen, every kid is wired differently. Like what works for me is not even what works for my sister necessarily, but even just making money kind of an open conversation, a comfortable conversation, not something that you ever tell your kid, we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. But tying back to your previous question too, about why parents don't always want to talk to their children. It's a reasonable thing for a kid to ask mom, dad, how much do you make? Because they're just curious. It's something they start to learn about jobs. You learn that you make money that way. Yeah. Well, the parents might not want to share because your kid might then go to the playground and tell their other friend how much money you make and yeah. they might get it wrong or yeah. it might make you uncomfortable for people in your community to know that. So it is perfectly acceptable to set boundaries around it. But another thing that I loved that I was once researching a story about how to talk to kids about money and a parent told me that what he did is he took out his I think it was just one paycheck, not even the, well, no, it was a full month's worth of income. He took it out in cash and he put it in front of his kids and set some money aside and said, this is what goes to paying for the house. This is what goes to utilities. This is what goes to food and physically started to move piles of money around. Then this is what we do to save up to go to Disney world. And this pile is what we have for any time we want to get a new pair of shoes, take a new ballet class, go to the movies. And so then they can also start to conceptualize this money is used to pay for all of these things. And there's some leftover and we can do some of the fun things, but we can't always do all of the fun things. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Here's the thing that I think was so impressive about this is that when you were given the option to build, make your own money, you chose, let me tell you how this would have gone down in our house. We have three grown boys. So our boys are 24, 22 and 20, but I am just thinking back. Had I said, you have to raise this money, you know what their first question would have been? What can I do around the house and how much can you pay me? So it's still coming out of my, my money. Like I would have not have they, know, didn't, they didn't go, they, they wouldn't didn't think go outside, outside the house. The money, yeah, yeah, they didn't think outside the house. I don't think they did anyways when they were younger mm-hmm. like that. So that's impressive skill set. And just, you know, just thinking of that through, like that's a good tip to make sure like you, and, and even to add as a parent to say, earn this yourself outside of me. Yeah, make money we don't have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and it is always an interesting conversation around things like allowance. I don't think there is a right way to do allowance, but I do love there's sort of two different schools of thought one is you do tie it to things that kids do around the house so that they can earn money because it's a situationally appropriate way for them to earn money but the other school of thought is they should just be doing chores as productive members of the household and if you tie it to allowance then they can get to the point where they're like i don't need the five dollars this week i don't want to do the dishes or whatever it is exactly yeah So, you know, that does become a little bit of a conundrum. At what point is it like, no, this is just your job as a member of this family versus like, hey, this is how you can earn money. Yeah, that's true. I think we definitely did the second, the latter, you know, we definitely were like, and it's still even today. I mean, if we said to our kids, hey, can you do the dishes today? Like, it's no big deal. It's like not, there's no debate here. But I can see where it could be a problem. It's mm -hmm. like, I've got... $20 Twenty dollars in my piggy bank. I don't yeah. need to do this today. Yeah, we we didn't tie it to money though. Well, yeah, we but I said, mean, if you did, it yeah, could be a that could be problem. a problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and it could be that you earn if you do above and beyond your job, then that's where you can earn the extra money. Yeah, yeah. you get some overtime there. And yeah, then you've got the exactly. whole quiet quitting thing. I mean, our kids can quit <laughs> yeah. at any time. Kids like, are going to be uh, quiet quitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't be having that. Well, it's funny no. when you mention parents are afraid to tell their kids what they make. I when my, our kids asked me, I wasn't afraid. It just felt weird. <laughs> and I was like, because in my family, we were in my parents, we never really talked about it. It was like, it was that subject that, oh, we don't talk about that. Mm-hmm. And probably because we didn't have much, but yeah. anyways, yeah. <laughs> but when they asked me, it felt weird. I'm like, oh, why shouldn't I tell them? And I don't, I wasn't afraid, but it was just a weird conversation. But when I told them, they were like, oh my gosh, you make that much money. And I'm like, dude, it's not that much. <laughs> Well, that's part of the problem is kids can't totally conceptualize what right. is a lot, you know? Yeah. And it's also going to matter so much based on situations like how many members are there of the family? Where do yeah. you live? What is right. the overhead cost month to month? Like just because somebody makes $120,000 in one area of the country, that does not mean the same thing in another right. area of the country. Exactly. So and true. if you're a family of six versus a family of three, those mean two very different things as well. Exactly. Yeah. We were yeah. just talking the other day with Jake and he, or that's our middle son. He's 22 and telling him, you know, he was asking because he's engaged. So there's, starting to think about all that stuff and he goes man I'm never having kids <laughs> like, no, it's a lot 
I hear they're expensive. <laughs> My dog is expensive yes. and that's just a dog. <laughs> yes, dogs are expensive. Okay, so financially speaking, what is the difference between tender dating and marriage material? Yeah, I love this question because it's still relevant. When I wrote that as a, as a header to my chapter, it was about seven years ago at this point. I'm like, man, I hope that's still relevant. You're still yeah. Tinder is still a popular app. Yes. So uh, pardon the way I'm going to word this, but the follow-up is really, is money a hit it and quit it relationship or marriage material? How are you treating your money? And what I mean by that is, is money something that you're not really paying that much attention to? You're not really building your own relationship with it. It just kind of comes into your bank account and you pay things and then you just don't pay any attention to it. And it just flows in and out every single month. Mm -hmm. Or are you educating yourself about basics of personal finance? Are you setting goals for your future? Are you figuring out how to meet and achieve those goals based on saving and investing? Do you have a debt payoff plan? Are you figuring out a budget for yourself, AKA a spending plan every single month? Like, are you really fostering a healthy relationship between you and your finances? Money is psychological more than anything else. Like that is the one thing that I really want people to understand is we often think, oh, this is math. Okay, sure. You have to do some basic math when it comes to money, but everything that can be done on a calculator that you learned by fifth grade. I hated math in school. Like, no, I didn't really too. hated math. And now I professionally write about money. So I just want to <laughs> promise people that you don't have to have had this great relationship with math. I also studied theater and journalism in college. Like I was not an econ major, I wasn't a business major, wasn't in finance, none of it. Yeah. But what so much of money is really is figuring out how it makes you feel, why it makes you feel that way, what your triggers are, what causes you to want to spend or save in certain ways. Do you have a scarcity mentality, meaning maybe you have a tendency to hoard money or you're very nervous about money? Like really investigating that about yourself yeah. is truly what's going to enable you to put a plan into action that's going to work long term or even for a season of your life, the way you handle money at 22 is going to be very different than 32 and 42 and 52. And you need to adjust accordingly also as your life changes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you say in your book also that we fall into three categories, which I love the YOLO FOMO, which I thought was hilarious, um, team guarded optimists and team dreaming about retirement. So tell us what those are about those three things. So the way that I think about those three, it's based a little bit on a study that was done by Dr. Philip Zimbardo, which is called the time perspective, which fundamentally ties into this fact that our relationship to time. So whether we think about the future a lot, if we're like totally hedonistic and living in the present, if we're maybe overly optimistic about the future, like all of our relationships to that, or if we're, you know, like chilling out in the past and just thinking about the good old days, that impacts a lot about how we live our day to day. Mm -hmm. And I decided to kind of link that into money in a very different way as well. So in terms of team YOLO FOMO, those are, you only live once, fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. Those who are unfamiliar with the acronym, <laughs> it is the people who are, this rounds on me. Mm -hmm. I will figure it out when I'm older. Oops, went overdraft again. I'm just not really going to stress about whether or not I can afford stuff. It just will work itself out. Like truly, truly just living in the present, maybe amassing a little bit of credit card debt along the way in order to do that. Team guarded optimists are the folks that are, you know, a bit more practical. Maybe they pick up a round every once in a while when they're out with their friends. They have some level of a budget. They're just, you know, kind of figuring things out. But on the flip side, they're like, man, by the time I'm 40, I'm like definitely going to have a few million dollars. Like, yeah. It's just really going to work out for me, <laughs> even though maybe I don't have a plan about how I'm going to get there. It's just definitely going to work out. Mm -hmm. And then you have the team dreaming about retirement, which are the folks that sometimes get overly fixated on the future. For those who have ever heard about the group FIRE, Financial Independence, Retire Early, it's a faction of folks who really fixate on saving, saving, saving really early, often tan in tandem with like high frugality, and then are trying to retire by like 35, 40, 45. Almost all of them are lumped into the dreaming about retirement, as the name sort of implies. But the problem is that sounds great on paper. It sounds like, wow, you're like so financially responsible. You're so prudent. 
it could come at the detriment of actually living your life. Mm -hmm. So truly what you want is a mix of all three. You want to be optimistic about your future, but you want to pair it with a plan. You want to live life a little bit along the way, but you don't want to be doing it in excess to the point where you're like putting yourself in a financial, you know, situation. Mm -hmm. And then you want to be thinking about future you and setting yourself up, but not to the point that present day you never gets to live your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay, so you mentioned those categories. What have you gone through in your life? How have you changed from younger to now? Have you gone through those different groups kind of in your own personality and mind? Uh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm 100% a dreaming about retirement person in the sense that it's never always been retirement specifically, but I've always been very future oriented, even as a kid. Like, I'm the kid who, when my mom did the marshmallow test on me, for those who are unfamiliar, a parent tells a child, here's one marshmallow. I'm going to walk away. If this marshmallow is still here, when I get back, you get a second marshmallow. But if you eat the marshmallow, you just get the one. You're testing for delayed gratification. Uh -huh. I'm the kid who just sat there with my hands crossed. <laughs> when my mom came back for the second one. I was like, yes, yeah. I still at 34 years old on my birthday, wait till like 11 PM to open my presents. Cause I want to delay the pleasure for like as long as possible. Like I am just hardwired for delayed gratification. However, that has plenty of negatives too, because it can come at the detriment of living your life mm -hmm. and bless my husband for being a little bit more of the, like, let's enjoy life along the way, because it does really help balance me out. And I'm not always hyper fixated on the future. I'm still pretty fixated on the future, but <laughs> there is some balance in there now as well. So that is something that like another person can have that grounding effect or just lived experiences. Mm -hmm. I famously will let gift cards expire because I'm saving them for the right time to use them. And then things happen like, I don't know, a global pandemic and you've been gifted $200 worth of money to a salon. And then that salon goes out of business in the yeah. pandemic. And you're like, I literally just threw out $200. Wow. That's crazy. That's hilarious. Yeah. So for my fellow gift card users who let them laps live a little he's <laughs> yes. it's a gift you can use it yeah yeah and your husband will be really happy later too the, the way that you've it's true you've brought to the table yeah. <laughs> and I do have a little bit also of the guarded optimist in me too I think that that is also a bit of a deeply millennial trait that thanks to the self-esteem movement most of us are like I'm going to be wildly successful in my yeah, life like yeah, I think that yeah. is just something that was fostered in a lot of kids yeah. with or without help from our parents like I just blame society for that one Mm -hmm. We did not give ourselves the participation trophies, guys. I just yeah. want to go on record saying That's the right. gold stars and the participation trophies. <laughs> you can blame the boomers for that. That's <laughs> all I want to say about it. That would be us. Well, we yeah. did that to our children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that of the three categories, I think I was, she was talking about them. I'm like, one of our kids falls into each of them. All three uh, of them. Yeah. Like they all yeah. line up almost perfectly. So yeah. They've got Is it tied to birth order? Because I always um, find that kind of interesting uh, too. It, you know what? It is the opposite of what you might think. So Yolo Fomo would be our oldest son. He's a raft guide in Colorado. Interesting. Yeah. So that's opposite. And then our youngest would be the one who's dreaming about retirement. Yeah. That boy is doing great. He's 20 and he's saving and wheeling and dealing everywhere he goes. And, and definitely middle child team guard optimist, which fits him. That fits yeah. the middle child. Yeah. For sure. Okay. So personality definitely affects how we handle money. But then we've talked a little bit about family history does too. So that can be a big roadblock. It was in my life, I know, because we, my parents didn't really have a healthy relationship and it didn't with money and it didn't really yeah. help me as we got married. So how can we get through that roadblock of family history that can hold us back from really knowing how to handle our money? This is where I really do come back to anybody who's listening that's a parent is thinking a lot about how you model money behaviors for your children, not just how you talk to them about money, but how you relate to money in ways such as what are the conversations you're having with your spouse or partner or with other adults? What are the uh, flippant comments that you make to your children about things when it comes to money? Do they see you stressed when you're going through the grocery store line? And even if money is a stressor in your household, one of the greatest gifts you can give your children is to figure out how to position it as just a fact of life and a neutral early on so that they are not inheriting that same relationship. Mm -hmm. And so much kids are 
coding their relationship to money starting around the age of like eight, eight to 11 is actually kind of like the prime years of when kids are starting to really develop a relationship with money, which sounds crazy because most eight to 11 year olds aren't really using money, right? but they're just coming into a different, you know, version of reality. Basically they're starting to understand the world a lot more. They're starting to really pick up on context clues in different ways. And so those are very tender years when you think about raising a child and not only talking about something, but really modeling the behavior you want for them. Mm -hmm. Thinking too about making sure that if there's a pain point for you as an adult, maybe investing is really stressful for you. You don't understand how it works. It's not something you've really engaged in, but you understand that it's a way to build wealth. Starting to educate yourself so you can pass on proper information to your children, or when your child gets to an age appropriate stage of life, maybe like 18, 19, 20, 21, especially when they're going off to get their first job, having conversations around, you know, I waited way too long to set up my 401k at work. One of the best pieces of advice I could give you is as soon as you have access, start and contribute to a 401k. Mm -hmm. Or we were really underinsured when it came to healthcare early on. And I know it seems like a really expensive monthly cost, but it's so important. And this is where we sort of had a misstep and I would recommend you do something differently. Don't hesitate to share the missteps that you made along the way with an adult child to try to prevent them from making similar ones. Yeah. Yeah. That's good so idea. what are your thoughts on like stock apps? I was thinking of Robin Hood and all that because our kids kind of dabble in that a little bit. What do you think about, because it's so easy to trade stocks now. It's just on your phone. So I have mixed feelings about them. And in large part, because some of them do an okay job of pairing with education, which I think is important. They have either whether it's pop-ups or blogs or whatever, where somebody can start to educate themselves. But honestly, investing should be like pretty vanilla when it comes to what you're doing. If you are going in and like constantly playing around with crypto or constantly day trading, that should just be a small amount of money that you're setting aside to play around with and not the bulk of how you're trying to build your wealth. Mm -hmm. And I say that just because statistically the odds of hitting in that way is sort of akin. That's when things get kind of like the Vegas scenario comparison is yeah. apt. Otherwise, I'm like, no, investing's not like gambling, except for if we're like, <laughs> look at this brand new untested asset class called cryptocurrency, and I'm going to put all of my money into it. Yeah. Well, diversification is another important part of investing, which means that not all of your money is in the same place. Yeah. And on, I mean, same goes with people who have a 401k and their company stock is part of that 401k and they put a hundred percent of their money into company stock. Bad idea. You want to make sure that you're diversifying. Even if you think the company is never going down, you do not want to tie your salary and your entire retirement account to one company. All right. To try yeah. to hit it big with one thing. Yeah. 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 That's true. So let's talk about the B word budgeting. This is, I think this is hard for everybody probably. Well, it's hard so, for us because we're both yeah. self-employed. So yeah, the money kind of comes and goes. Yeah. Yes, that gets a little tricky for us. Like it is like, whew, it's either highs and lows. And so, yes, give us, give us all the wisdom. Well, first I'll start as a fellow self-employed person. Mm -hmm. For me, what was a massive shift in how I handled my money and a bit of a revolution was I started to just pay myself a steady salary. And that started maybe about four or five years ago, where instead of trying to figure out kind of based on how much I had earned and what my runway was going to be, I just sort of did the math of consistently every year I'm earning at least this. And so if I'm earning X, then I can pay myself safely Y. And so some months might be a huge earning months and some months might be a little bit of a dry spell. But if I just consistently pay myself this set salary, I'm never going to run down my business account. Mm -hmm. And so to whether you're doing it through, you know, a payment portal like Augusto or something like that, or whether you're just like, here's my business checking account over here. Here's my personal account. Once a month, I go over to business and send myself a lump sum of money as my salary. That was a huge shift because then I did have an amount of money that I could budget with for my personal life. We're talking separate from the business. Like that was a big change. So for anybody who works on commission, is self-employed, has variable and volatile income, figuring out how to pay yourself a set salary will do wonders for actually having a spending plan. And that's part two. If you don't like the B word, call it a spending plan. I don't care. Use whatever <laughs> term you want. 
anything that makes you feel a bit more, you know, I'm going to opt into this experience because yeah. I will hear all the time. people like, Oh, I don't have a budget. I'm like, you do. It's yeah. how you spend your money. <laughs> so it might not be one you're paying attention to, but that's still a form of a budget. Yeah. And the repositioning that I would really encourage anybody who's like feeling itchy and breaking out in hives, just hearing me like repeat the word budget over and over. <laughs> think about the fact that you want to be in control of your money. Like that is really the strategy here is you want to be the one in charge. And if you do not know where your money is going every month, if you do not decide where it's going, it's just really controlling you at the end of the day, a budget, a spending plan, whatever you want to call it, puts you in control. Mm. Also, there are so many different types and what works for you in one season of your life might not be the right fit in another. So be sure to analyze whether you should change and evolve it over time. But if you've tried one budget and then like, it didn't work for me. So budgets are not for me. No, 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 no. That kind of budgeting is not for you. Let's try something else. Or maybe it's a hybrid of two different kinds of models. Mm -hmm. I know for me, especially as somebody who's self-employed, I love the zero sum budget strategy where every dollar gets a job. Every time I get a paycheck and my husband gets his, his paycheck, we have a grid that says exactly where every single dollar goes. Mm -hmm. And then there's still a little bit of room for play because both of us get a, I do not have a better term for this allowance yeah. <laughs> where we each get a set amount of money. It's the same amount of money that goes for us into two different checking accounts. It's each one of us still has a personal checking account. That's mm -hmm. just ours. So our allowance money goes into our personal checking account and we can spend it however we like that's your plan. that money. I don't have a set budget for it. just really varies from month yeah. to month. And if I blow it all on the first part of the month, I'm like, I yeah. either have to dip into my little savings pot or, oh, well, you can't do anything else the rest of the month. Yeah. But do you, yeah. I can't see you blowing money at the beginning of the month. Do you, do, have you done that? Or? Oh yeah, I've yeah. done that because I mean, sometimes life happens, right? Like every yeah. so often you get into that situation where it's like, your three friends all have their birthdays within the same period of time. And then on top of that, you have to buy like four baby shower gifts. And then on top of that, you want to buy like something for yourself. Like things just happen. Yeah. And it also depends on how you structure your budget. You know, do you guys have a line item in your household budget that like, oh, this is for going to birthday parties? Or is it like, that's your friend and it's just you going, so you use your own money. Like, it just yeah. kind of depends on how you handle stuff. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. I was totally yesterday, Jake and I were talking about credit reports and all that stuff. So he was like, and I'm not great at, I try to talk about it, but I'm getting better. But tell us what the difference in a, Jake needs to listen to this part for sure. <laughs> tell us the difference in a credit score and a credit report. Yes, commonly confused. Mm -hmm. So one of the best ways to think about it is the report is your homework assignment. It's the essay that you wrote for English class and the score is the grade at the top. Mm -hmm. So the score is a reflection of what's on the report. Okay. The report fundamentally is what matters mm -hmm. because the report is what informs the score. Where it starts to get really complicated is two different companies are doing these things. So there are three main credit reporting bureaus. That is Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. So those three different companies are the ones that collect all the information from your lenders or whomever else. So let's say that you have an auto loan, a mortgage, a student loan, and a credit card. All of those people are reporting information to the credit bureaus. Here's where it gets more complicated. Not all of those people report to all three credit bureaus. They might just report to one or two. So credit bureaus can also have different information on you. Mm. It's wildly frustrating and you can't control it. Yeah. But we're just not going to deal with that. <laughs> so the all of that information is getting reported to Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. Those guys are putting it on your little ledger. If you pull your own credit report, which by the way, never hurts your credit score to pull your own credit report. In fact, you should be pulling your own credit report at least once a year to make sure it's accurate, mm -hmm. particularly if you are a junior or you have a fairly common name because sometimes things get mm -hmm. misreported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So checking your own credit report and seeing like, oh, yep, I always pay all of my loans on time. I always make my credit card payment on time. Even if you're somebody with absolutely no credit card debt, 
that information that like, hey, you use this credit card and you paid it off every month, that's still getting reported uh-huh. to the credit bureaus. And then that information is helping inform your credit score. So that's why you can build a 700 plus credit score without ever actually having debt. Because mm-hmm. if you just use a credit card well, yeah, you can have a really high credit score and never, ever carry debt. The other thing about credit scores, there are some folks in the personal finance space who are like, who cares about credit scores? You don't need them. You should pay for everything in cash. That's nice. If you can do it, most of us can't. Okay. Like the idea of being able to like pay full-fledged for college, buy a house outright in cash, get a car outright in cash. That's yeah. kind of unrealistic for most people. Yeah. I like to think of a credit score as an insurance policy on your financial life. Mm-hmm. And by that, I mean, the better your credit score, the cheaper your rate when it comes to any time you need to borrow money. Other people also look at these things. Your insurance providers might pull your credit report and it could impact your premiums. An employer might pull your credit report, particularly if you're going to be working with money or if you are going to be given like highly sensitive classified information. They want to make sure that you're not being squeezed in some other area of your life. Yeah. A landlord is going to pull your credit report and score. So there are all sorts of different areas of your life where this can still be really beneficial and helpful. And like I said, using a credit card well, you can have a good score without actually carrying debt. Hmm. Okay. Good. So I know that like the major credit cards, like, you know, ones that I get airline points and such, you know, your people who put their stuff on there and they pay it off at the end of the month or whatever. But does the same ring true on a credit score for like, I have a department store. I go and buy, like, I literally make the purchase because I get like 20% off or whatever with the card. And then I literally tell her now I'd like to pay that balance. I do it right there at the counter. So does that impact my credit score also? So this is going to get a little in the weeds here, but (laughs) if we're just talking specifically about credit cards, there is a difference between having a balance and carrying a balance. And this is really important because there is this huge myth out there and I don't know who started it. I think the credit card company started it. <laughs> but someone started a myth that if you carry a balance over month to month, so instead of you get that bill and it says you owe $300, you pay $250. So you leave $50 on there because it's better to have a balance so that I think people misunderstand having and carrying a balance. Yeah. This is about to sound complicated. I'm going to break it down. Credit bureaus, the people who are collecting the information, report whether or not you have successfully paid off your balance every single month. So what can happen? Let's say that you have, and I'm just going to name a name because we mentioned department stores. This is not an endorsement by any means, but let's say you went to Gap They're like, hey, you get 20% off if you get this credit card. And you're like, all right. And you get a gap credit card. And that's the one credit card that you have. And let's say that you have spent, it has a $1,000 balance or line of credit. So you can spend up to $1,000 and you have spent $100 at the store that day. So you have used 10% of your available line of credit. Okay. Now, what can happen is that if you then rate then and there at the cashier say, hey, I'm going to pay off the $100 I just spent right here right now. At the end of the month, when the statement comes in, you're just going to see $0 balance, $0 owed. And to you, that feels like, great. Yeah. I did spend some money, but I paid it off. All right. What now gets reported to the credit bureaus, though, is that like, well, she has a credit card, but we don't have proof that she's used it and knows how to use it responsibly. Okay. So it's not necessarily going to generate positive information for your credit score. Hmm. So what the strategy becomes is that you don't want to use more than 30% of an available credit limit ever. Like that's just the rule of thumb. It's called credit utilization. It accounts, it's the second biggest factor of your credit score. It's 30%. So think 30, 30. You, it accounts for 30% and you don't want to spend more than 30%. So if you have a thousand dollar line of credit, don't spend more than $300 in a month. Mm -hmm. Then as soon as you get the bill, the bill will say, okay, you spent $300. The minimum due is 25 and you know, the balance is 300. Don't ever be fooled by a minimum due. Just ignore it. Just pay the (laughs) full balance that you owe. Because if you pay the minimum due or anything less than the full balance you owe, then you're starting to carry debt over month to month. And now we're starting to pay interest on debt. And I think sometimes, especially when you first get a credit 
card statement. It's like, oh, I only have to pay $25. Great. Yeah. It is so easy to misunderstand that. So always pay the total balance owed. But if the credit report or the credit statement has cycled, so if you've gotten the bill, you have 30 days to pay it usually like 26 to 30 days. Mm -hmm. So you're not in debt if you're paying it off on time and in full. That is having a balance. Carrying a balance is when you don't pay the full amount. Okay. And I think people just fundamentally confuse the difference between having a balance and carrying a balance. Yeah. So what I always recommend to people who are just purely looking to build a credit score, but maybe are a little bit afraid of carrying a credit card and the temptation it might bring for them. Again, I'm just going to name some companies. These are not endorsements. It's just easier <laughs> to do this way. You probably have a Netflix account or Hulu or HBO Max, Max. I don't know what we're calling it now. You probably have some streaming service get a credit card, link that credit card to paying your streaming service. So every month your credit card is used to pay your Netflix bill. And then you can automate your credit card payment to happen every single month when your statement hits. So okay. now let's say you have a thousand dollar line of credit and you're only spending like 15 bucks a month on it. You're in the single digit utilization. Credit bureaus are like, ooh, this is so sexy. Credit <laughs> are like, this is amazing. We need to work with this person. Yeah. 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 And you don't even have the card in your wallet. You don't have to think about it. You're not tempted, but you're creating a system where it's pay the thing, pay the thing on time. It yeah. reports great. My utilization is low. And your other huge factor of a credit score, there's five factors, but utilization is 30% paying on time is 35%. So wow. 65% of your score is two factors. Yes. So if you miss a payment, that's when they're also like, mm, not trustworthy. Because the biggest yeah. indication to them, if you'll make payments on time in the future is if you've done it in the past. Yeah. So that should be your number one goal is paying on time. Number two goal is for credit cards, utilization low. Yes, okay. that's such good information. Yes. yes, so good. We have, like I said, a son that's about to get married. And I think that this broke millennial workbook that you just came out with is going to be the perfect wedding gift for every yes, person we know in this exactly. season. I mean, we've got to get this for Jake and Kate because they ask a lot of questions about that, just like he was talking to you in the car. I think this would be a perfect thing for him to have and to understand all the things that you just said. So congrats on completing that broke millennial workbook. I'm really excited to get my hands on that. How does that help us in life? Like, how does that go hand in hand, like attack, helping us attack debt? I mean, these kids, of course, they don't have any debt. They don't even know anything about that. And the thing that I was telling one of my clients the other day is like, when we got married, I had to get off my parents' car insurance, I think. And now those kids, they're on our car insurance. They're on our cell phone bills. They're on our Netflix account, Hulu account, Amazon account. Like I need them off of everything. Like I'm kicking them <laughs> off one by one. I'm trying to figure out how to do that, but I got to give them some tools. So tell me about this workbook. Well, the workbook is informed. The whole series is four books, the workbook being the fourth, and it is all new material. You do not need to own the previous books in order to do the workbook, but it's really informed by all of the content in the previous books and everything I've seen since writing them. So there's even wow. parts, the first book, for instance, if I could get in there and update it, there's a part about emergency savings funds that I would update and the workbook has said update. So it really also not only gives you the information, it encourages you. I can't say forces because I'm not there to be like, pick up a pen and do this, yeah. but it encourages you to actually put pen to paper and figure things out because you can read all the theory and all the strategies all day long, but until you actually face your numbers, until you actually create the plan, until you actually put it into practice, it's all just theory. Yeah. And the workbook really encourages you to do that. And it not only focuses on here's different strategies for creating a debt payoff plan. Here's different styles of budgeting. It also works on like, Hey, here's an inventory of questions for you to answer, to think about what is your relationship with money? Mm -hmm. How does money make you feel like that is one of the first questions that I ask in the workbook is yeah. when I say money, how do you feel? Write it, write it down. Mm -hmm. And I had somebody the other day, a coworker of my husband's was like, I got to be honest, I opened up the workbook and I read that question and I was like, oh no, panic. <laughs> but that gives her so much information too. Like if that is the first reaction that she's having, that's so much insight into how she relates to money. All right. And then the other thing, especially for couples getting married, there are whole chapters about how to navigate money and relationships, how to talk about money with your partner, how to successfully have these conversations because they can be really stressful. And particularly for couples getting married, 
doing the inventory of how does money make you feel? And then sharing that with your partner is critical because so often when we get into fights with our partners about money, it's less about the actual money. It's more about the values and what this is signaling to your person. So if you value saving, saving, saving for this goal and your partner is valuing spending, 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 we're at a clash. Mm -hmm. And how can we reconcile these things? But also maybe let's explore what is triggering your partner to spend. Why does stress make them want to go out and buy something for that dopamine rush to feel good? What is that coming from? How can we create systems to try to resolve that? Yeah. Do you think it's good, like, um, for, would it be good for a couple to work through this before they get married, before they've like put their accounts together or anything like that? Or do you think it's like after that? I think it's great to do before, but if you're already married, Mm -hmm. it's still helpful, especially too, if you're already married and your system doesn't seem to be fully working for both of you, that's another part where it's like, Oh, There are other ways to doing things. And particularly for married couples, I think so often we get this script kind of handed down. That's like, Mm -hmm. Hey, here's how married couples handle their money. Everything is joint. Everything is together. Always. You are now one amorphous blob. (laughs) Obviously that's not true. And for some people being a hundred percent joint on absolutely everything is going to be what works for them. I'm like, great. But for other people, being 100% separate is what's going to create the best ecosystem for them. I personally love a hybrid. Let's do a little bit of both. But you do need to really think about what works best for your actual ecosystem and not let other people's opinions influence what works best for the two of you. Yeah, that's great information. Jake and Kate know what they're getting for their wedding now. Yeah, they're getting this book. (laughs) They get the book and they're going, oh, we're just getting this book, but look how much money they're going to make off this book. Yeah. Because they know how to handle it. They're going to know how to handle it. They're going to order one today for us and them. So we also have a great way to start. Right. Yes. So Aaron, this has been so great. So full of information. You've got a great brain in that head of yours because we do not think numbers like you do. I know you're not a math person, but you seem to be flowing some of that. (laughs) So we appreciate all this great insight information. It's been so good for us. Well, thank you so much for having me. And like I said, you don't have to be a math person, but right really a lot about psychology too yes yeah feeling comfortable knowing how things work that's the last thing i'll say about all of this is particularly you know just speaking more to the american system but we're all playing rules of a game at the end of the day when it comes to a lot of things about finances and understanding things like how overdraft fees work how banking products work Whether you should switch your banking products, that would be my other big pitch, both in the first book and in the workbook, is are you using the best financial products for you? Mm -hmm. Understanding how credit scores and reports work. This all matters because we're operating in this ecosystem that's been created for all of us in the financial system. And you really can't choose to opt out, to be honest. So just understand the rules of the game that you're playing, and then you'll be able to play it better. Yeah, that's exactly mm. right. Yeah, Love I think it. that that's we spent the, a lot of our marriage not understanding the rules of the game. We thought we could opt out, but we realized we could. <laughs> we realized we could. Yeah. And self-employed, that's a that's a tricky factor. Yeah. So yeah, but we we have learned a lot today. So even us old people can learn a lot from what you're teaching. Yeah, don't let the word millennial also. Speak oh right, it. It, it really is for everyone. I just it is. millennial. Yeah. It totally is. When I was listening to your book, that's exactly what I thought is I'm like, I need a pen and paper because I thought this was going to be something I could just listen to and it wasn't going to be applicable to me. It is totally applicable to everybody. (laughs) So we appreciate you taking time to talk to Hardy Cardi at five and a half. You're a delightful person. You got a lot of great information out there and we can't wait to um, get that on our hands to our kids for sure. Well, thank you all so much. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Rebecca, can you believe it? What? We learned about how to eat the biscuits and spin the biscuits. <laughs> oh Did that work? I've been working on the analogy the whole kinda, time. Kinda. Do you no. spin biscuits? No. I don't know. It doesn't Maybe work. Maybe it didn't work. It doesn't okay. work, but basically I do want a Bojangles biscuit now. I do too. <laughs> Maybe my sister who lives in North Carolina can ship us one. I don't think that's going to taste the same. Yeah. Remember the last time she shipped us something? Yes. Okay. Three Christmases ago. <laughs> This is three years ago. I was at their house and I was in a blanket in their chair. And I'm like, this is such a great blanket. So that was in November. So of December that year, this is 2021, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not three years ago yet. She sent me a blanket, the blanket that I love so much. Mm -hmm. And she wanted 
me to get it for Christmas. Well, it never showed up. It showed up like two months ago. Yeah. So it took two years for the two blanket years. to get to me. And she mailed another one after that because we didn't get that one. And, we and we've never, we haven't gotten that one. So maybe mailing a biscuit's not going to I'm going to eat a biscuit and for your sister. <laughs> two years later. <laughs> if it's from McDonald's, we're safe because those. It's never going to go bad. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's a true statement. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed this interview with Aaron Lowry. If you have anybody that you know that can benefit from this information, I'm ordering 10 books right now off of Amazon. Like, I can't wait for to get it. Yeah. Uh, I'm super excited for it for ourselves. And I'm super excited to give it as gifts or, I don't know, like anything that a person could need when they have a birthday or anything. Well, it's like we talked about with her. It's in, you can, you can act like it doesn't, it's something you don't have to deal with, but we all have to deal with it. Yeah. No matter how much money we make. It's something, and it really, in talking to her, it makes me realize it's our personalities, it's mm -hmm. our family history, it's just how we deal with psychology. life in general. It's psychology. It's how we deal with life in general yeah. affects how we deal with our money, and yeah. we've got to deal with it. So. It's a lot of psychology and a little bit of math. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's what we learned today. Yeah. We hope you guys enjoy this interview with Aaron Lowry. Party party five and a half, over and out. We'll see you next time.